Uh, Neelam talked about policy. I will be talking about governance, the challenges of governance. And this is basically a challenge of centralized imagination of policy. And what are the what are those challenges and you know how can we overcome it? So our understanding is that you know this centralized governance actually poses problems. So we'll have some case studies which illustrate that, those governance in practice, and then kind of come to our understanding, you know, how participatory governance can actually overcome it. So so this is the structure of the presentation. We'll talk about the present governance structure, the present funding of sanitation, how it encourages centralized imagination. Then the limitations of governance, we will illustrate through two case studies. And then we will tell and talk about, you know, how our alternate paradigm can work. Uh, so this is the kind of you know policy uh, and governance uh, architecture of uh, Indian sanitation sector. So one is you know we have the Ministry of Urban Housing and uh, Poverty Elevation. So that's more of the kind of slum development, you know marginalized sections, you know. So they deal with that. And then we have Ministry of Urban Development, which the Nodal Agency of Urban Development, where they kind of take up big infrastructure projects, funding up that JNNUR, like, you know, big infrastructure projects. That's the second one. And the third one is Ministry of uh, Environment and Forest and Climate Change, which actually looks at an entirely different thing of uh, environmental regulations, environmental protection, but they have a huge influence in sanitation sector also. Because they, they are against, you know, kind of uh, effluence coming into the water bodies and things like that. So they also have a major influence in urban development. Huh? So these are the three major ministries that we have. Let us see what is under them. So under these two, we have this uh, state slum development board, rehabilitation boards, projects concerning <coughs> poor and slums. That comes under MOU HPAA. And then MOUD has state boards like the Kerala Water Authority or the Bangalore Water and Sewerage Board, you know. So they, those come under here. And then the public works department sometimes kind of work with them. And the big projects, so it's basically implementation of big water supply and sewerage projects are coming under them. Um, and then when you come here, there is a central pollution control board which is supposed to be the kind of you know, central agency for pollution control. And under them, there are state pollution control boards. Uh, as uh, Neelam was mentioning, they, they, are, uh, they, they have you know, kind of mandate, but we see that you know, they are a bit toothless also. So we'll understand why it is. Uh, so one of the things that we saw is that you know, it, their imagination is pollution control by policing. You know, can we go and kind of you know, issue orders and you know, and we had a case study of the LAP office. They had four uh, engineers, environmental engineers, and uh, then they have to kind of regulate something like thousand units, like from a floor mill to big industries. You know, so what what they do is that you know every uh, I think every two years or so they have to renew their license. How can anybody kind of you know go and physically inspect thousand units and do that? You know. So they have to kind of issue those licenses otherwise. Um, added to that, they have these house boards also, which are also regulated by them. So it's a, you know, so it's very difficult for them to police and do that. And that's why we we, we, we talk about participatory governance, where social regulation can also come. How can citizens kind of participate in analyzing what is pollution, in kind of you know helping them to kind of generate data? and helping them regulate that also. You know? So that's why the, the shift has to come. Uh, another major thing that happened in the 90s is the uh, constitutional amendment for decentralization. You have heard about Panchayat Raj and Nagarapalika according to 74th amendment of the constitution. Many of the powers have come to urban local bodies. So that is the major shift that has happened here. But the problem is that you know they don't have capacity. And in a state like Kerala, you know, in 1996, almost 40 of the budget was transferred to these three-tier institutions and Nagarpalika institutions, which now reduced to 28% or so because of the centralization that's happening. But uh, in other states, we don't know how much of that has happened. And despite this, no devolution of staff has happened to ULPs. 
So we have these big water boards like Kerala Water Authority or Bangalore Water and Sewerage Board, which have a lot of engineers. You know, like we have something like 5,000 engineers. But uh, if you go to a municipality, there will be a few engineers. So that devolution will not happen because it's 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 a pride to be. Uh, uh, you know, kind of engineer of a Kerala Water Authority or PWD and not a municipality or panchayat. So people actually won't go there to kind of uh, work there because you have big infrastructure you are doing in the other one and you know. So devolution becomes a major problem. So these institutions are completely understaffed and undercapacitated. I think that's one of the major problems and that is one of the things that we are trying to fill in also. Can we crowdsource capacity is the question that we are asking in this project also. There are fragmented institutions. If you come to Kerala, the sewerage projects are done by uh, Kerala Water Authority. And sometimes it's done by municipalities also. They don't have the capacity. So it will go to, a, that I will tell you, you know, what is the kind of fragmentation that's happening. Then we have two missions. One is Sujitta mission. And then the, the other one is, that is Clean Kerala Mission. The other one is Hydra the Mission, that is Green Kerala Mission, which is actually done by this government. So these four uh, structures actually work in, uh, in, in, in sanitation. So uh, as Neeram was mentioning, National Urban Sanitation Policy wanted one institutional home for sanitation. But when it is four, we don't know how it happens. So it's, there's a fragmented decision-making structure in, in there. And then I told you about the decentralization. The state governments and the public utilities doesn't feel that municipalities are capacitated enough to give them that, the funds. So there, are, there, there there's a problem. And then financing, uh, if you see, the these are actually kind of you know, big committee reports. And, and uh, partly it's kind of World Bank and ADB kind of understanding also that water boards recover only 30 to 35 percent of the total operation and management you know, uh, expenditure that is needed. And not a single Indian city of any class or size recover the full o &M charges. And leading to suboptimal functioning of STPs. I'm not going into the debate, but you know, this, this whole what we call as the neoliberal turn in policy, where everything the markets have to take care, you know. Uh, that perspective actually sees every activity should be profitable. But water supply to a level can attain that. Sanitation has to be a public thing. It's very difficult for markets to work in sanitation. So these are one of the public goods that the state should provide. Because if you have a good sanitation, if there is no wastewater, no pollution, it actually saves public health and even private expenditure on health care. So the, these are public goods that has to be taken care of by the state also. So we, we cannot completely kind of, you know, tell that, you know, you have to recover your full oil, operational management and things like that. That's a debate we don't get into. But please take, take, take in mind that this has to be a public good also, whatever public pollution control and, you know, things like that. Then let us look at the allocations, allocations by by, by, by big, uh, you know, government funding. We see that, you know, there is this big programs like the Jawaharlal Nehru Urban Renewal Mission, which actually then um, uh, gives funding for actually big infrastructure like centralized wastewater management infrastructure. Smaller cities constituting 30% of the urban population, they will not kind of get much funds. Then slums, slums are constituting 17 to 0.2% of the urban population. And these cities and these sections of population are systematically marginalized from these kinds of allocations. And so larger share per uh, city goes to bigger cities and metropolitan cities. So I think the five major cities get 70 percent. Yeah. So the five, I, uh, five major cities in India get 70 percent of the allocations of their You know, it's, it's actually uh, uh, in a way justifiable also because they cannot actually think about participation or decentralization or anything. And that's the need why you know smaller cities like this have to and, and smaller city and we have seven thousand you know kind of towns in India, including census towns and all. 
So if you make a model for this 1 lakh, 2 lakh kind of cities, it's going to give a kind of representation of 80% or 90% of the cities. Huh? But all policies, all thinking, all research in urban studies is going to these big cities. Huh? So that's why we, are, we have brought you to here. <coughs> I didn't bring you to Bombay because Bombay can survive on its own. It has big researchers. It has you know, many other things to kind of say. Let's come to small cities and kind of try to understand what's happening there. And then, um, yeah, one of the major other things is that, you know, big projects have time cost overruns that you already know. That means, one, it takes, if you if you plan for five years, it may take 10 to 15 years to complete. That's a time overrun. Cost overruns is that, you know, your, your first estimate will be 100 crores, and at the end it will become 250 crores. So, you know, these all we say. Let us look at one illustration, two illustrations of that. That's what I'm trying to do. You know, the central assistance, for example, increased from 3,700 crores in 2005 to 43,000 crores in 2011. It's partly because there were a lot of central government, you know, foreign funded central government programs like Jawaharlal Nehru Urban Renewal Mission and all. Second, there is this MDG goals in this million in development goals, which actually gave a lot of trust to sanitation, you know, public health and things like that. So all this actually brought in a lot of allocations into the sector. Um, so the imagination of this also has increased. So we have a big commission called, you know, a high power expert committee. It is chaired by uh, Mrs. Uh, Isha Jad Alawaria, who is a very famous economist. And then they calculated that you would need something like 31 lakh crore for capital investment and 8.17 lakh crore of operation management expenses to make Indian cities clean. So that works out to be per capita 13,329 capital cost and 840 annual operation maintenance cost. Do can we afford in India? We are 1.4 billion. Per capita is 13,000 that they are asking. And that's also because of this big centralized imagination that's working in their minds. And she's very active in this. She actually uh, goes to these big ADB funded projects in some cities, you know, like Udaipur and, you know, and then actually writes, writes in newspapers how well this city has actually managed this and all. But the imagination is this. So that's one. Second, then we calculated the estimates, you know. So the average cost of a sewage project under JNNURM is 3.33 crores, one MLD. That is one million liters per day if you want a project. It, the, the, uh, even the capital cost is something like uh, 3.33 uh, crore per MLD. Running cost for 20 years is 8.10 lakh crore. So when uh, I was uh, the coordinator of the uh, policy group of the Inter IIT consortium, who looked at the Ganga Basin Management Plan, so seven old seven IITs came together, and we had uh, seven groups we worked. So policy group I coordinated. So uh, just looking at this allocation, we calculated just for class one and two cities, uh, the uh, the per day effluent is 11,000 MLD sewage that's coming out. And we found that we need 57,000 crore just for the capital investments for Ganga Basin alone, and that also for class one and two cities. So I want you to kind of just think about whether this is a feasible option, this kind of centralized imagination. You know? So that is all calculations. Now let us come to a specific project because case studies are very good. You know, case study is a is a microcosm which actually gives you indication of the macro cost. So it's like, you know, you can, it's, so case study actually gives you a good picture of what's happening. So this is a study that we did from 2007 to 11. 2006 to 11, uh, we, were, we were part of a South Asian, big South Asian project where uh, four South Asian universities came together and did kind of research together. So we had 20 PhDs and 150 M techs that came came out of the project. Huh? So what we decided was that you know we will kind of you know cross uh, uh, supervise PSDs also. 
So th this is the PSC that I supervised. And when we started this project in 2007, uh, there was a there's a proposal for a sewerage treatment plant in Kandy City in Sri Lanka. So we just kind of uh, just diagnosed that proposal. And uh, after four years, when the project was over in 2011, still the pro the the project has not started, but the budget has increased, and then it is still not started, and the proposal amount is still going up. So one is, you know, the, we, we are very, uh, it's like, actually it's comparable to Alapi. We have 1,60,000 population in Kandy, and Kandy, as many of you know, is, uh, is, is a very cultural capital of uh, Sri Lanka, because you have the Buddha's tooth temple there. So you, so you have the Mahavali River and the Mahavali Lake. Both are very precious for the Buddhists all over the world. So, uh, uh, JICA, there is a Jap Jap Japan, uh, Japan International Cooperation Agency. Uh, they came out with this proposal that you know they will fund this. Uh, so, it's a population is 160,000, water consumption is 25,000 cubic meters per day, and 80% of this released into Kandy Lake and Mahavali River. A proposal for a centralized STP, uh, the estimate was 3 billion in 1998. And when we start, and in 2011, when we uh, were finishing, we gave 18 billion. Um, and so that was uh, um, uh, something like, you know, in, in 13 years, another seven years is gone. Then 83% uh, of this has to come as a soft loan from uh, uh, Japan. So what is the technology choice that they had? The technology choice is that, you know, you can have different levels of purification. Huh? So if it's just disinfection, it will be like cost will be 0.5 to 1.5, you know, uh, cubic meters, you know, ru ru rupees per cubic meter. Partial treatment, full treatment, advanced treatment, it becomes 75 to 100. Huh? The, co the cost of treatment will be something like 150,000. So the point is, they chose the highest level of technology because that is the for a, for a lender, it's very good, isn't it? As the scale of the loan goes up, it's good for the lender. So for a foreign cost of the loan, for construction contracts, engineering services, almost 50% goes back to the lenders. Huge benefits of selling the black box of technology for the plant and pumping station. The technology is not kind of, you know, it comes as a black box, it's not explained what it is. So that your expertise also can come along with that. And then huge benefits, then uh, the operational maintenance, more than 40% of the oil costs for chemicals, repair and maintenance, 90% goes back to donors annually. So it's a very dependent kind of a technology, where chemicals and all have to come from there. Consultancy, we found that it's a very inflated, you know, uh, consultancy expertise that's being charged in the project, which will come in the next project also. And then what are the burden to the borrowers? When you look at the burden, the laying of sewer lines, repair of roads, and you know, kind of uh, ensuring power supply, all this comes into the government. And Kandy is uh, like any any of our city, narrow roads and you know, not planned. It's all haphazard roads and things like that. Uh, you know, normally in the in the in the in the original imagination of a European industrial city, it's a very planned city. So your sewer lines, your water lines, all this can be planned. So here that's a problem. Then uh, inclusion of low income settlements, which is actually comes to 40 percent in the case of uh, Candy, that's the responsibility of the government because the the project funds doesn't take care of that. And 10 percent of the capital cost is OM cost, that is kind of 11 million per month. That's also uh, the responsibility of the government. And this all works out to be 410 per month. Even water supply, we won't kind of look at that. So my student worked on this, this aspect, actually. You know, what is the kind of you know, a tariff that should be then fixed for this? And then it, it found that you know, it's not politically feasible. Then, the government has to subsidize that also. Um, then we found that you know there is an overpriced foreign expertise that's going to manage the project, and we have a uh, you know like Nehru, you know they also have you know kind of tall leaders at that time, 
and it was all kind of, you know, we were all trying from 50s and 60s to develop this public sector, you know, we are all, our own expertise for design, implementation, everything. But, you know, this, so there, there's a lack of institutional access to expertise for this project. That means whatever engineers that we have, they, they will not have much to do with these kinds of big projects coming. Uh, then continuous import of materials and expertise dependence on the donors and then the most curious thing is that the end of the pipe solution. Uh, you actually bring all the pollution in candy to one point. So and then there should be continuous you know running of this whole machinery. And Sri Lanka is like us where we have 8 to 10 hours of power cut maybe and in that case the pollution in the Mahabali River increases 700 percent because otherwise it is going to different streams and you know groundwater and wetlands and things like that. Now you centralize that into Kandy River, into Mahabali River, which actually is us. You know, so, so whatever you kind of originally imagine is going in the opposite direction. So this is the problem with the energy pipe solution that I was telling yesterday, where you centralize your everything together. Uh, now let us come to Trivandrum. Uh, so after this, uh, we had the Ganga Basin project where I looked at many of the kind of UP, Bihar, class 1 and class 2 cities, same kind of story. And then I found that in my own city, Trivandrum, there was a, some, something happening from 2014-15, you know, an STP came. Uh, so we did a case study of that. There is also an interesting transition, you know, from, so this is a city which actually got water supply in 1931, one of the earlier cities, you know, like one of the first eight cities which got uh, water supply during the British period. And then uh, there was a, um, there's a sewerage farm also, like in 1930. When water supply came, sewerage farm also came. So all the, all the wastewater used to come to a farm where they used to kind of grow fodder there. And then 1947, public health engineering department or the public works department began which became PhD in 1971 and this is also Neeram's thesis has very well brought that out you know like how the kind of uh, imagination of sanitation changed by the government of India over a period of time. So in 1970s, 1950s, 70s it was all public health and slowly by 1980s it became water resources development and infrastructure building after 1990s. So it become an infrastructure sector which has to get loan and infrastructure has to be developed. And the earlier one was more social and public health. So that shift also is one of the major shifts that have happened in policy. 82, water resources department. 84, uh, it was turned into Kerala Water and Wastewater Authority. And then in 1986, Kerala Water Authority. That means, you know, from government to para state. So that it can attract more loans. With one World Bank loan, it became a para state agency so that it can attract a lot of foreign funding. Uh, I told you about this, an 8 MLD sewage farm was there. So it was actually sustainable utilization of the wastewater of the city where fodder was uh, made and the entire you know kind of fodder needs of the cattle population was met by by this one. People used to come there, collect the fodder and give it to and even Kerala Agriculture University farm was being kind of fed through uh, this one. Um, and in, but slowly the system deteriorated also because the supply increased. So by 2009, the government of Kerala went for a ADB loan and a JNNERM loan. So when those loans come in, you, what you say is that, you know, you ring fence that funding. Huh? You, you build a fence over that funding that that fund will never be utilized for anything, any other purpose. Because otherwise it goes into the kind of black hole of the government machinery. So to avoid that, what you do is you ring fence and you make a SPV, special purpose vehicle, which will actually be done only for this purpose. So this SPV was called KSUDP, Kerala State Urban Development Project. So they were responsible for this. And then we we just looked at you know ADB loan was the amount of the loan was nine nine five four million rupees, which is seventy nine percent of this, and the state government share was you know twenty percent of that. That's two six nine one. 
and the municipal corporates that you give 11 percent, that is 15, 80 uh, million dollars. That means, you know, 30 percent of the government funding alone is a huge cost. And Jain and is much worse. Even the even the twenty percent of the loads come to more than forty three thousand million rupees to get something like one lakh seventy two uh, one point seven two million um, million. That, that you know I don't know the numbers. You can try to look at that. You know, but the point is that you know this is a huge amount and this is a huge amount. So if our government is actually spending it. Is there a better way to kind of spend it? Is the question that we can ask. Huh? Uh, the new governance structure, your government of India, which gets the JNNURM loan, it comes to the local self government department of the of government of Kerala, and then it comes to municipal corporation. Because according to decentralization, municipal corporation is the nodal agency for sanitation. ADB loan. Um, also, it's like that, and both this come to a project management unit, that is KSUDP. And then there is a technical support unit, which is set up by one Japanese company and an American company. So these two companies, you know, came together, and they were the technical unit, where you know you had engineers from those. And then there is something called the project implementation unit, which actually, <coughs> so this was in two corporations and three panchayats. So each one of them will have a project implementation unit and then you get something called the design service unit. We found, you know, then we found that, you know, this is actually the poor here. You, you have any, 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 uh, can you kind of imagine who, who will be here? These are retired engineers of Kerala Water Authority. Because you know they know how the system works, isn't it? They are the best people who know for the last 30 years, and they made a complete parallel structure with this. And Kerala Water Authority, which has all the expertise, is completely marginalized from this whole thing. And the retired engineers are happy because they get a pension and they get a, some kind of a small consultancy, and they have recruited you know kind of young engineers also to kind of run around. So then, what could be the problem here? So, uh, so municipality doesn't know what's happening, and they are supposed to be responsible for this. So let's see what is that. So this is the fragmented governance. Uh, if the water and sanitation services is shared by municipal corporation, KWA, and SPB, because KWA still has to be there because they are the technical provider, and urban local body owns the whole infrastructure. And SPB coordinates design and implementation. And then they have a company, uh, it's a turnkey contractor, who will do the operation maintenance for the first five years. And you know in first five years, nothing dramatic happens. After that, they will leave. Um, we found that you know the KSUDP actually maintains their accounts and all well, but it's not public. Second, you know, the number of revisions with average 50 percent hike in budgets have happened in the project. Then there is another interesting thing called minimum commitment of the loan. So if you have a 100 crore loan, in the first year you should be spending 20 percent. Second year you will be spending 30 to 40 percent. Ratio may vary, but there is a minimum commitment that you should be doing that. If you don't do that, you invite a penalty. So you have to quickly spend it. So you will spend it on some things. You understand? So there's a spending spree. And these are blotted projects also. So you have to spend something. Otherwise you will invite a penalty. That's another major. These are clauses that people don't know. Penalty is, you know, it's like, you know, you will have to pay some, some more money in that. They will they'll take away some money. Like 50 crore will be taken as penalty <coughs> from the next loan. You know, one of, one of my research associates actually spent in KSUDP a long time, you know, kind of reading the small print that is there. That's when we identified all this. And she posed as an intern. Otherwise, they would not get it. So, 
this is one example of the timeline. You know, so March 2008, the detailed project report was prepared. June, the technical and financial evaluation bids to ADB was done. So September, it was re-tendered, and December, the tender document was 5.5, you know, kind of million. And then when when so in three months when the award, it was awarded, there was a more than 50 percent hike in. And this people doesn't know, you know. Actually, up to this people will know the tender notification and all. And this happens underhand. If even this can happen in Kerala Water Authority. I'm not telling that it's only because of a foreign fund project that is happening. But here, the it's 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 in a much more higher scale. Why you need an SPV is because you don't need to follow the procedures of the government system, in which you can be caught at some point of time. Here, this is all kind of you know understood and silently kind of you know. So only a, a, you know this uh, what called everybody loves a good drought. Is it going to be silent? So I, I found that everybody loves a good project. Poor are involved in this. They will all get benefited. Even the engineers in Kerala Water Authority are not uh, complaining because you know they finally have to sign. The design and all are done by the consultants, but the signing is done by them. Then you know what happens. So earlier they had to design and you know they had to do all that. And curious thing is that you know the Kerala Water Authority MD is is no longer you know it was an engineer all the time. Then it became IAS. Now it is IA and AS. Some AGs will come there because big things that are happening are accounting. Big foreign funded projects are happening, so you need you need. To, so one of my students' work is that you know how public water utilities, how the engineering, you know how the engineers are losing and how it is kind of becoming, you know more kind of accountant oriented and things like that. So this is the institutionalization. And that's why engineering education has to quickly improve and you know kind of uh, answer to these de these demands from below us. Because the design content is all gone. So that's why we in this you know we are trying to kind of make them design uh, the civil engineers and all. So this is one one thing and this we have a 107 MLD, 107 million liters per day capacity project. Huh? But your sewer capacity is only 30 percent. It has hardly improved 3 to 4 percent. And this was done by the Maharaja in 1936. So after this big project, the sewer capacity has increased only 3 to 4. So only the plant is there and this other one. So we thought why it is, you know. Then we found that, you know, one, I, what I told you about the candy system, our roads are not, you know, there. But in every kilometer, because it, this is by gravitation. So in one kilometer, you will get into a head of something like one meter or more than that. Then you need to pump it. So that means you need 20 cents of land every kilometer as pumping station. Which then, where do you get in, you know, our kinds of cities? So this is the major challenge. You know, we are not ideologically against centralization or anything. There are huge practical challenges. In 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 uh, you know in Alapi, you won't get a head at all because it's a plain thing. So you need much more kind of a pumping. So pumping is not only energy, but it's only it's it's also land. So this is one of the huge constraints of the centralized system. And then uh, in Jain and Yuvanam, very strangely, no allocation for land for buying land. So where do you get that land? Then, um, so you have very high, you know, impressive detailed project reports cannot be implemented. This is another curious thing. You know, it's the preponderance of consultancy. We found that you know, this is the percentage of consultancy over a period of time. So in the first year itself, 84 percent is spent on consultancy. The Japanese will come and take away their consultancy in the first year itself. Then it is your your engineers who can. That's why we then need retired engineers to kind of come and design the whole thing. So you know, so it's a, like the candy case. You have a very interesting, you know, 
uh, uh, technology dependence, which is an old thing. We, we thought that in the 50s and 60s, we thought that this technology transfer is a uh, is, is creating dependence, and you know, we thought it's a old debate. No, it's very new through the funding, through the neoliberal funding that's happening now. So that's that's the first thing. Second is, you know, uh, so if there's a zero percent interest rates in Japan. You know that. So even a soft loan invites something like two percent for the state government, and then you have a central government there who is a money lender who gets a profit in that. So at the end of the day, it's not a soft loan for government of India or to the state government. The central government gets so two percent. I think you know how much the state government will will get it for. But for the Japanese government is actually the machinery, or as a country, it's the kind of you know their own machinery that's coming, their own expertise that's coming. Bullet train, wonderful. You can you know kind of run like a bullet. But the point is, you know everything comes from there. Your bogies, your rail tracks, you know everything is constructed there, and it's only kind of you know put here. So you know you 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 just look at the kind of you know flow of money. 1880, Dada Bai Nauroji wrote about drain theory. How the British develops us. You know what we are paying for the railways. What you know what is the kind of drain that's happening. And so we do you think that we are independent now? So I think this is where you know we have to really think on our own kind of feet, which which most of us doesn't have a shoe also. We think that you know we think on our own shoes, isn't it? 90 percent doesn't have shoes also in this country, so we have to really think about you know what is actually important for us. So this is it. So the first year is 84 percent, and the, on an average it will come something like 18 percent is the kind of foreign element of the consultancy that's happening. So this is the kind of observations that we have. One, there is a financial crisis for the KWA. We do have to really think about why. And then lack of planning and foresight, urbanization, growing population. So there is no kind of technical imagination of the next 20 years or something how we should move for the for our own public water utility. So it's not any foreign prop, prop, any, for person's problem. It's our own problem that we are not kind of thinking with foresight. Second is you know th thus it invites soft loans with unequal and opaque terms. Then we have global standards of infrastructure, like what she was telling, you know, like uh, the, the um, SLBs, you know, the service level benchmarks, where all the, all the population have to be connected through sewers. Very good. London has done that, Paris has done that, Trivandrum should do it, is the kind of, you know. So that's the global imagination of, a, of, of, of that. Uh, leads to de skilling of Kerala Water Authority engineers. Plans done mostly through retired personnel and uh, international consultants cornering bulk of the consultancy. Uh, so, you know, the context, our context has challenges in accommodating global models. All of you agree? This global imagination, our context has a problem in accepting that. Can we think about what our context is and then plan? That's a challenge that we have to, you know, kind of ask. So fit in models to context or conceive models that suit the context? That's the question that we are asking. Uh, these are some suggestions like you know how to bring in transparency, accountability, and participation and governance. Uh, yeah, how to bring in more ownership by the staff, staff unions. Is there a process to kind of do that? Um, bring analytical inputs from the academia. How much can engineering education you know, kind of feed into practice, and how much can the academia learn from practice? So, can there be a synergy that's being brought up so that we have contextual education also? That as you are out of your engineering college, you can plan the infrastructure also from here. So, you don't need to have foreign consultants coming in. And once this Jehruvin engineers are retired, we have a big vacuum there deinstitutionalization and that's when they can come and take over because the big technologies can be handled only by them isn't it so in Cochabamba for example you know in uh, in uh, Argentina 
in many Latin American countries, this has happened. Many French companies have come and they took over. But the problem is that, you know, it was too, too much of hike, and so people have reacted also. So, so need to change curriculum from academic side and openness from, uh, you know, kind of what utilities. Develop a new breed of engineers who can practice the art of engineering beyond the science of engineering. How to talk with people, how to design from below, you know, those kinds of things. Then dialogue with universities to incorporate these into curriculum. So those are the things. So my last slide, we can kind of recoup all these things. So there's a global policy discourse and then infrastructure discourse, which actually <coughs> is, 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 is very global which comes to international financial institutions and this come become their vision documents this comes to government of india and then this also become funding conditionalities and this and then we have old state public utilities which are kind of bypassed because the funds have to come to urban local bodies through the, the international financial institutions also need that because they don't need to deal with the big state, the big public water utility where they are engineers. So if that is not there, then it can happen through uh, SPVs. That's where the SPVs, the, so national water policy also will reflect all this. And then you have, you know, water engineers, speed level bureaucrats here who are actually bypassed. What happens is that you have an expert provider, that is the big consultants, who directly comes to the local body. You understood this? There is a, there's a global discourse. That global discourse gives us global finance, and the global finance gives us global consultants. They bypass the central and state governments and come directly to the municipality, who doesn't have any capacity. So since there is no capacity, there is a parallel body that is being made. That means these government institutions get deinstitutionalized, decapacitated. Huh? And so the point is now urban local bodies are they do, they need to play a plan that assessment, technology selection, institutional options, implementation, monitoring, and regulation. All this have to be done by the urban local body. So the challenge that we are posing from this project is that can academic institutions be knowledge providers? and local NGOs and residents associations and all, can this realm work with these people to help them kind of get into this? So there are, so local actions, how can local actions be there? So, uh, so when you choose this, actually there's no model for that. How do you do it? So that's our protocol. And it's a, it's, it's, it's an evolving protocol. So it's very important that you know our our so our this exercise is very important to kind of refine that protocol. Thank you. <coughs>